am, of course, your friendly neighborhood, General Lutz. Halloween is one of my favorite holidays of all time. Why? Because I've always been a big fan of dressing up as fictional characters, or as we would call today, cosplaying. Ever since I was nary a lad, I loved dressing up. One of the very first costumes I remember actually dressing up in was a Batman costume. And there's actually one memory that I have quite fondly of dressing up in that Batman costume, putting socks on my hands to simulate bat gloves, and riding around the neighborhood I lived in at the time, making bat cycle noises. Oh yes, I've always been a big fan of the Batman. And of course, a few years later, I would dress up as the Spider-Man as I got into that particular character. Ultimately, I'm a big fan of Halloween and a big fan of October in general. And for October, we're of course going to take a look at four survival horror video games. Today, we're taking a look at Dino Crisis. Next week, we're taking a look at Extermination. And then the week after that, we're of course taking a look at Nightmare Creatures. And finally, for the special Halloween day, we're taking a look at Resident Evil Outbreak File 1. So with that, let's take a look at Resident Evil with Dinosaurs. Dino Crisis was produced and directed by Shinji Resident Evil Miyakami and developed by a team that would become a part of Capcom Production Studio 4. They developed such games as Beautiful Joe and Resident Evil 4. Miyakami chose Dinosaurs because he wanted to move away from the more fantastical elements of the Resident Evil series. Because cloning dinosaurs is so much more realistic than creating zombies and mutant animals. Miyakami cites that he was inspired by the films The Lost World Jurassic Park, a film saved only by the inclusion of the absolutely excellent Pete Pusselwhite and his awesome acting ability, and Aliens. And really, you can see more Aliens influences in the game than Lost World Jurassic Park ones, as the game really does feel at times like an Aliens survival horror game, only with Riptor instead of xenomorphs. The game itself was marketed as more panic horror instead of simple survival horror, and it was considered this because the dinosaurs were more aggressive and could chase the player about. And Miyakami himself stated that Resident Evil was horror in the funhouse, and Dino Crisis as more visceral horror akin to riding a roller coaster. Unlike with Resident Evil, which uses 2D bitmaps for backgrounds, Dino Crisis uses a real-time 3D engine for the backgrounds. And Miyakami chose this engine so that the game would be both more cinematic and dramatic than previous games. This 3D engine did cause a few issues in development due to the fact that this was supposed to be a game on the PlayStation 1, which was a 32-bit machine and by 1999 was starting to show its age. The team found it difficult to create detailed environments, however in actual practice they did an amazing job and they looked just fine. They did run into an issue when it came to creating a jungle scene and thus they had to cut it out. Now Miyakami chose once again to keep most of the game indoors and he did this because he felt that it helped build fear, and it definitely does. The dinosaur AI was based around that of lions and tigers and other carnivorous animals, but Miyakami felt that the AI did not go far enough. However, I feel that he wanted to be a bit too ambitious. He wanted the dinosaurs to have their own personalities so that they could understand the player's physical condition and then ambush them based upon it. This seems to be a recurring issue with dinosaur games. The developers always want to do so much with them and end up never really doing anything at all. Turok 2008 was supposed to have a virtual ecosystem. Eh, uh, well, they, they cut that out so we could just shoot dinosaurs. And Jurassic Park Trespasser is probably the most infamous one. They wanted a whole AI system where the dinosaurs would actually seem like living, breathing creatures, only they found that they couldn't actually program such a thing, and also it kind of messed up with the physics as well. And ultimately, they just cut out all the dinosaur AI, so all they did was just attack you. Ultimately, being ambitious is good, being too ambitious is not good to say the least. The number of dinosaurs would be increased for the North American release, but the number of dinosaur species types would remain the same. 
In the end, Dino Crisis would be unveiled at the 1999 Spring Tokyo Game Show and would be released in Japan in July of 1999, two months before the third installment of Resident Evil. Dino Crisis, as you would expect from a Capcom game of this era, was a massive success with the PlayStation version selling 2.4 million copies. It would be ported to both the Sega Dreamcast and Windows in the year 2000. However, we are taking a look at the PS1 version played with EPSXE. A top-down version of Dino Crisis was to be developed by the development company M4, but like with the Resident Evil Game Boy Color game, it would be cancelled. However, interestingly enough, M4 would go on to develop Resident Evil Gaiden. What's interesting is the fact that another developer would try to create a Game Boy Color port of Dino Crisis. Said developer was Fluid Studios, and it was to have contained all four characters from the base game, and have even featured seven maps and 100 different rooms, and five different dinosaur types. Sadly, as cool as this sounds, it was also cancelled. So now that we know how it came to be, let's take a close look at just what Resident Evil with Dinosaurs looks like. Dino Crisis has gameplay that, while similar in concept to the Resident Evil series, is not identical. Rather, it improves upon just about every aspect of the early Resident Evil series gameplay. The controls are far smoother and more intuitive than they were in Resident Evil. The menu system has also been improved tremendously. In the Resident Evil series, you were severely limited in what you could carry, and while it fit with the game, it was really bloody annoying at times, too. There are so many instances in Resident Evil where you have to backtrack to a bloody item box so you can drop off a thing so you can go and pick up the next bloody plot govern. Here, that is not the case. Rather, the inventory is divided between various categories, key items, weapons, ammo, and various healing items. Now keep in mind, you can still run out of inventory space, so be careful when picking up random items. This game features the 180 degree turn that is extremely useful and would be retroactively added to Resident Evil 1 in its remake. Like in Resident Evil, the shooting is second stage to the puzzle solving, but unlike in Resident Evil, the shooting is far easier, with Regina here actually auto-aiming so that one can actually hit an enemy. Whatever next! That was a minor issue with Resident Evil. Sure, in that game, you're just supposed to run away from enemies and not fight them, but at times, you bloody well can't, and hitting anything in that game took a bloody act of Congress. Not to worry for you pro-MLGs out there, you can disable auto-aim for masochist delight! The enemies in the game are all dinosaurs, and they are all deadly and require that you have a quick trigger finger to put down. And they can all do a good amount of damage as well. This introduces the new healing items. You have the basic med kits, and they can be improved by finding various items and mixing them together. The game is also merciful when it comes to restarting. You have these resuscitation packs. If you die, these will magically bring you back to life outside the last room you are in, which thankfully takes out the tedium of getting back to go. The game also introduces a bleeding mechanic. If a dino savages you, you will start bleeding, and the bleeding effect is actually pretty bloody cool, and you will leave a trail of blood until you patch yourself up. But you cannot just slap a med kit on the wound and hope it goes away. Rather, you need a special item to stop bleeding, called a hemostat. This will stop the bleeding, but won't raise your overall health. This might seem like it could get annoying, but there are usually enough healing items to be found to ensure that you don't get screwed. One aspect of the UI that I don't really like all that much is the fact that you can never see Regina's health outside of visual cues. While the visual cue health system is cool in theory, in practice you never know if you're getting low until you're actually almost bloody dead. Saving is also handled differently and more conveniently as well. No more ink ribbons must be found. Rather, you merely need to find a safe room. And just where would a good survival horror game be without its widgets, widgets, and most importantly, its gubbins? There are so many bloody things to keep track of, it's not even funny. And surprisingly, it doesn't get annoying, nor does it get tedious either. And really, once you learn what you need and how to use it, it becomes second nature. You start off with your basic keys, then you have a weird key card kind of thing. Key card? I don't need no fucking key card. Well then, how about this? A door that not only needs a keycard, but also a code widget. Oh, and on top of that, you have to have a password.
password. And you might think you just find the password written down somewhere. Nope, you gotta decipher it yourself. Thankfully, deciphering the passwords is not all that difficult, and the game does tell you how to do it. Really, while this game might be a bit more merciful than the Resident Evil series in some ways, it makes up for that in others. You can also find medical cabinets scattered about the game that will have healing items within, and you can store excess items in them as well, but you cannot just access them right off the bat. Rather, you must first find a gubbin to access them. Wouldn't want you to start getting soft on us, Shinji. The puzzles for the game are Capcom standard. They can range from easy to annoying, and they really do add to the overall enjoyment of the game. The graphics for the game are nothing short of exquisite. Sure, they might have aged a little bit. Okay, fine, perhaps they've aged a lot. But the level design still holds up, and the cinematic camera angling system has been improved tremendously from the Resident Evil series, and it is about as good as it ever gets. With all the angles actually being cinematic, and the level detail is as high as it was in the Resident Evil series, and the levels themselves hold up a bit better due to them being 3D rather than being simple 2D bitmaps. In Resident Evil 1, at least, it was a little bit jarring to come across the 3D models at times, since they looked so different from the backgrounds. The character models also look quite good and have fluid animations and better detail than seen previously, with Regina having an awesome communicator that lights up now and again. The dinos themselves are all quite well rendered, with numerous details to be found, and they also look quite well animated. Overall, in the 90s, this game would have looked amazing, and in the modern era, I feel it still looks pretty bloody good. Not not just for a 90s game, but for a game in general. The music for the game is pretty bloody good as well. Since this is a horror game and not an action game, the soundtrack is sadly not rockin'. Rather, it is ambient and creepy and does a good job putting the player on edge. The whole game succeeds in this as well, as the colors and pacing create a tense atmosphere and the game can really cause a player to panic, as the dinos can jump on the player from out of nowhere. And in a slow paced game like this, that can really scare the shit out of somebody to say the least. And there are a few places in this game that actually made me jump a bit. Because this game actually knows how to be scary. It doesn't have orchestral build up, it doesn't even tell you that there's going to be a scary moment. It just happens. This bloody T-Rex and this bloody scene made me jump out of my bloody chair and actually shout, oh shit. That actually happened. Because you don't know it's coming. You're just checking the room like you would any room and then boom, T-Rex right there. That was fucking brilliant to say the least. The game also has a panic mechanic that is sort of a proto-QTE. There will be times when a dino grabs onto you and you will have to hit the buttons on the controller to break free. This could be seen as annoying, but let's face it, it actually makes a bit more sense than other types of QTEs. When you get surprised in a game like this, your first instinct is to mash the various buttons to get away, rather than carefully pushing the square button or the X button. Thus showing that Capcom, at this time at least, understood how players really thought. Sound design for the game is as excellent as Resident Evil's, but the voice acting on the other hand is a vast improvement in that they actually hired some bloody voice actors, and it sounds pretty damn good. Just listen. Alright, you have your access to the underground, Gale, so get moving. You handle your things your way, I'll handle my things my way. Punk is really starting to get on my nerves. Regina, I'm heading out to investigate the underground. Now, let's take a look at the excellent story for Dino Crisis. When you first hear the title, Dino Crisis, your first instinct might be to assume that the story is just going to be some sort of excuse plot to shot dinos and find key. Thankfully though, the plot and presentation for Dino Crisis is nothing short of amazing. Unlike with modern games, the writer actually knew how to write and actually made the plot pretty bloody compelling. The game also understands how to juxtapose being cinematic with actual gameplay. There are numerous cutscenes to be found in the game and numerous story bits as well. 
And like with Resident Evil, the game knows when to let the player actually play the game and when to show the story. The game starts up in the space year 2009. You are Regina, a female U.S. Special Forces operative and member of the rather humorously named SORT team. Anytime someone tries to feed you the line of bullshit that there are no female protagonists in gaming, call them out on it. Please call them out on it. Because anyone who has ever played any number of games has already known that there are plenty of female protagonists. There have been many throughout the years, and in fact, it's not a new thing to have a female protagonist in a survival horror game. Really, the people who say that there is sexism in video games do not play video games and likely lack the opposable digits necessary to operate them. That sort rant aside, the sort team is sent into the island of Ebis Island, and they are sent to collect a Dr. Kirk. When you arrive at the island, you find it deserted, and when the game starts up, you get a real aliens vibe, as you don't even fight anything until a short while into the game. And the research facility itself really does feel like it could have been owned and operated by Wayland Yutani. The game also has a significant emphasis on character interaction between the sort team, and each member is memorable in their own way, similar to the Sulaco Marines and Arnie's team in Predator. Regina herself is really quite cool as well, and is an awesome Ripley styled female protagonist, and she actually has a decent sense of humor as well, and a few funny lines here and there. This isn't a joke, you idiot. We were just attacked by a big ass lizard. Due to the massively improved graphics technology between this game and the Resident Evil series, the game really does feel much more cinematic than previous survival horror games, specifically in terms of the story's cinematography. The shots are more snappy and feel more alive, and far less flat. One final and super cool aspect of the game is the fact that you can actually have choices as to what you want to do in the story. What? Play your way? I thought we had to wait until 2012 to be able to do that! Yes indeed, there are times in the game where you actually have to make a choice, and that choice actually has an impact. And like with Resident Evil, player choice is really what makes this game great. At no time are you really railroaded in what you have to do or where you have to go. And due to this, you actually get to experience the game on your own terms instead of simply having the game dictate everything for you. As you can imagine, I highly recommend Dino Crisis. It does everything that Resident Evil did, only it does it way better. In fact, you can look upon Dino Crisis as a refinement of everything Resident Evil. And really, it does deserve a remake in the same vein as Resident Evil 1's remake. With a new coat of paint, this game could be competitive with many modern games. Ultimately, I am Jiralots, and I'm wishing you good nightmare creatures, and good Martian Gothic, or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed my review of Dino Crisis, please consider subscribing, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue to bring you these great survival horror reviews.